Hi, I'm Jeff Garrett. I'm Dean of the Wharton School, and it's the 14th of April 2020. And it's my great pleasure today to be joined by Josh Harris. Josh is not only a proud Wharton alum, he's a member of our Board of Overseers. He's also a co-founder of Apollo, the second largest private equity firm in the world by AUM, and also the managing owner of the Philadelphia 76ers, the New Jersey Devils, and Crystal Palace in the English Premier League. Josh, great to see you today. It's uh, great to be here and be speaking with you. And so uh, we have a we have a we have a lot to get through, Josh. Let's start with macro. Um, this morning, this morning the IMF came out with their re re projection for 2020, minus three percent global growth, a, a swing from plus three to minus three. Um, we've had a fiscal stimulus already in the U.S. that's twice the size of 2008-9, and the Fed looks like it's behaving behaving even more extraordinarily. Uh, what's your take on on the macro environment in the U.S. and the world right now? Yeah, so when you think about um, the a, a minus three to a plus three to a minus three swing, Jeff, that's six trillion dollars off the global economy, and in the U.S., um, the estimates are that depending on who you ask, that we could lose about 20 percent of GDP from last period in this quarter to so minus 20 percent growth rate. Obviously, that'll be hopefully better as the year progresses. And so there's been extraordinary stimulus measures and extraordinary actions from the Fed. But um, obviously, with the economy uh, down by, in, by that amount, um, it's hard for them to sustain you know, the economy for, for very long through either fiscal or monetary stimulus. So the Fed's done a great job of getting the markets operating, uh, fixing the markets so that there wasn't, you know, huge dislocation. The government has done a great job. The federal government here in the U.S. has done a great job of making sure that uh, unemployment uh, benefits are being paid quickly and doing a lot, lot uh, for both businesses and for individuals to make sure they're taken care of during this huge crisis. Uh, but at the same time, until we get the economy moving, um, you know, it's going to be very difficult to sustain these types of extraordinary fiscal and monetary measures. And we're kind of mortgaging our future. Like we've been, we've fast forwarded by a decade. You know, the U.S. is debt to GDP. Uh, we had to do it. Uh, the Fed's balance sheet's bloomed well beyond the is, is blooming well beyond where it's going to be in the financial where it was in the financial crisis. And so. Um, you know, we had to do that also, but like, you know, there's going to be a lot to pay back over time and we need to. So, Josh, how do you how do you feel about the so-called modern monetary theory? The fact that, you know, in a low interest rate world, we can just borrow, you know, we can, in essence, borrow infinitely. There's no cost to that. Are you worried about the growth crowd out? And, and how do you feel about the idea that President Trump is refloating, I guess, that if there's going to be another big round of fiscal stimulus, it should be infrastructure focused? Yeah, so I think, unfortunately, like we, I, I'm, I don't, I, I think there are many, many consequences of over leveraging the economy and, and over and over monetizing the economy with a flood of, you know, Federal Reserve money. On the other hand, I don't think we have a lot of choice. I, I'm supportive of what the federal, federal government and the Fed are doing. Um, and I think infrastructure, certainly there would be a return on that. It was necessary anyway. And I think it would actually be quite a good idea. The nation, I, the nation's infrastructure from the roads to the bridges to the airports needs uh, a lot of uh, help. And so that would be one way to get the economy moving. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, we, we, it's you know, all this stuff will have to be paid back. But I think the social cost of not doing it outweighs, you know, the the, the fact that we're over leveraging. And I think what the long run of this, the long run of this is Japan ahead. and Europe. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No. So right, and, and with aging populations, obviously in in Japan and Europe, making it more challenging. The U.S. still looks better demographically, but if we if we switch to uh, Apollo for a second, um, you know, typically crises are are buying opportunities for private equity. But you, you obviously Apollo has morphed into much more than a private equity company. You've got a very big credit business these days, and you own a lot of assets. Could could you talk a little bit about where the firm is right now and how you're thinking about, you know, the next six months, the next 12 months? 
Sure. So first of all, we're a firm of 1,500 people at Apollo and 300,000 people in the portfolio companies that we touch. And so we've had to, uh, first and foremost, take care of those people, make sure they were safe, handle, uh, you know, we closed our office uh, in the middle of March. Uh, we started working remotely and, um, and, and then getting people focused with Zoom and with other technological tools and then making sure that the portfolio companies were tech enabled and setting up a huge database uh, for everything from how to take care of people to, you know, how to, uh, you know, deal with the, some of the government assistance programs to, uh, to charity and, and helping, you know, the world. Like Paul has given away up to, uh, $50 million and bought everything from masks. Like we had, we had portfolio companies that had extra masks. We shipped those. And so all of that has been, um, you know, first and foremost, like on our minds. Beyond that, in terms of investment performance, obviously, um, I'll, the, the private equity in general, private equity industry in general has a large portfolio of assets. And so it um, is experiencing markdowns that are going to be maybe similar to a little bit less than the S&P 500. And the S&P 500 was down, you know, in the 20s. And I would expect, uh, you know, private equity to be marking down their portfolios by that amount. But the good thing about private equity is that um, we we have the ability to uh, to take actions and to and to be not to sell, right? Not to realize on those marks. And so, over time, I would expect that um, as the economy improves, that many many private equity companies will survive and flourish. And so, the key is not to turn turn mark to market losses into realized losses by either being forced, you know, to sell or selling. I think the other great thing about, good thing about private equity alternatives in this case is, you know, we entered the crisis with approximately 50 billion of unspent capital. And so clearly, um, you know, we've been very agile in terms of how we've reacted to these markets. And we, we actually across our platform have invested about $10 billion in capital into the markets. And, we did that early in the uh, cycle, uh, early in the situation, and you know when uh, you know the markets were very volatile. As you know, one of the uh, derivative effects of the Federal Reserve being as aggressive, appropriately as it was, and the federal government being as aggressive, appropriately, is that the markets we think have gotten ahead of themselves now a little bit in terms of the fundamentals of these companies, and so we've slowed down a lot, and actually have even in some cases, sold some of the positions that we acquired. So that, I mean, that's a really important insight that you think the market is ahead. You got a little bit excited on the stimulus side. But what about the third um, kind of corporate debt and the fact that Apollo has become a big player in credit markets? You know, people are very worried, obviously, about credits. Is there a role that you see you can play in this environment? Yeah, so clearly the Federal Reserve has, in essence, raised its hand and said, like, we are going to be the lender to uh, large companies, to investment companies. And for the first time in history, they've taken the extraordinary move of including um, fallen angels. So people yeah. like Ford that uh, used to be investment grade that are now uh, not investment grade, as well as they've, uh, they've now allocated money to buying a high, the high yield ETF index. And what that does is it buoys the whole high yield market, but below the investment grade space, um, there's still thousands and thousands of companies that have no revenue or limited revenue and lots of costs and their EBITDA, their cash flow is plummeting. And, and they just don't, and the, the Federal Reserve programs help the markets at large, but they don't extend to these smaller mid-sized companies. And, the SMA, so to speak, there is some government program towards the SMAs, but it's uh, it's pretty restricted in terms of who can avail themselves of it. And so, the opportunity for private alternatives in general is to uh, and insurance companies and other non bank lenders is to fill the gap and fill in, you know, for the thousands of small and mid sized businesses. And these saying small and mid sized might be a misnomer. It's everything from a business of 20 or 30 of EBITDA up to maybe could be several hundred million of EBITDA and thousands of employees. It's small and mid-sized relative to the very large corporate uh, borrowers. And so, you know, that is the role that we're playing right now. And we're, 
you know, there's a lot going on and a lot we can do to make sure that these companies are able to sustain their employment bases and keep operating in a, in a situation where there are no revenues. So uh, let's pivot, Josh. I, I noticed that behind your head, uh, there's a proud Josh Harris, uh, New Jersey Devils jersey, I think. Yes. Um, so and a Sixers hat. Don't forget the Sixers oh, hat. I, I mean, we have a Sixers hat. Well, you know, of course, I'm a big Sixers fan too. I put it on for this. Hey, I love it. I have that one myself. <laughs> mine's, mine's a little faded now, actually, because I wear it so much. But um, so, you know, the role of sports uh, in society, I mean, it's not only big business. It just has massive consequences, right? And, and the fact now that, you know, sports junkies, all we can do is watch watch old games on, on TV. Um, Adam Silver in the, in the NBA looks like he's been a real leader in the crisis on so many dimensions. How are you thinking about a return, a return to business for either league, uh, NBA or NHL? What would it take? Do you think we're going to have a season? Are we going to conclude seasons in either of those sports? Yeah, so I'd say sports is amongst those industries that have been severely affected. I mean, obviously, um, sports are played in the context of large crowds. And so the NBA and the NHL had to stop their seasons mid-season. Um, and, and, and so the, you know, and, and I'll speak for myself, just the everyday occurrence of many, many sporting events, and baseball has yet to start, um, we know I really, as a, as a fan, and I think a lot of us are in this place, we really miss just the, the ability to watch sports and be involved with our teams. Um, I'd say that, so, and sports, and so that, that happened. Um, the, both Adam Silver and Gary Batman are doing a great job at um, trying to figure out, okay, how can we finish a season here? And um, I think that um, everything is on the table in terms of being flexible about, you know, how much how much of the regular season you would play and how you would play the playoff series. It doesn't necessarily need to be a final season, uh, the, or it doesn't necessarily need to be the same season. And there are even things on the table like, okay, how could you play in one city or in a few cities a tournament? Um, and in terms of this type of discussion, the key is, and, and could you do it without fans and just broadcast it? So all of those things are being explored, and everyone from the commissioners to the players to the teams to the fans would like, you know, as long as it can be done in a sensitive way, because there's a lot of tragedy that's going on. It might be something that could be done to lift the national mood, and even the president has asked uh, for options. So, so that's on the one side. Everyone is trying to do it, um, and we would need to start that at some point in July to be able to have a season because you have the following season coming. Uh, we need to start to do something. Um, the flip side is obviously the uh, health of our players and the health of our fans is paramount. And uh, there isn't, um, you know, there, there, there's not a lot of clarity yet around, you know, how you would do that in a way that would keep the players safe and certainly the fans and even if you played without fans, um, you know, if you, you know, you'd have to, in essence, set up a quarantine. And is that possible? And do the players uh, think that it's appropriate? Do they feel safe? And so there's a lot of dialogue going on, you know, as to how you might do that. And what the commissioner have said publicly is they're just not going to make a decision and that the earliest that they would make a decision is May 1st. And so they're, we're, we're continuing there. The leagues are continuing to explore this. And. We're lucky enough to be blessed with great leadership, and so we'll have to wait and see where it comes out. But I think as a general matter, um, it would be great if we could figure it out. But it's going to depend on safety. Yeah, and I have to say as a fan, you know, obviously it would be really weird for these professional athletes, in essence, to be playing in gyms on their own. But I think it could be quite fascinating for fans because you'd hear more of the action. It would be like being courtside, right? You'd, you'd hear what's going on. You'd hear interactions among players. You'd hear what's going on between coaches and players. It could be fascinating, of course. You know, we, maybe some of that stuff is not quite G-rated enough for, uh, for regular broadcast TV. But let's, you know, let's hope we can get there. But the other thing to say about sports teams, and I know you and David Blitzer and others have been so engaged in this, is 
sports teams are parts of communities. And, you know, in Newark, New Jersey, where the Devils are in Philadelphia, these are pretty close to the epicenter of the crisis. So can you talk about a little bit about what you've been doing uh, in, in the communities where, that, you know, that love and belong to your teams? Yeah, so David and I have always been believe in the power of sports to bring people together and to create unity and to lift the kids and particularly kids, but kids and communities that are in need. And so we were all we've always been doing things. When the crisis happened, um, <clears throat> you know, it was a wake up call to us that whatever we were doing, you know, we needed to do a lot more. And um, we we went out and we. Um, you know, looked at how we could help Philly, which is a great community, how we could help the surrounding areas, Camden and other areas, how we could help Newark. And we focused on um, on food, first just delivering food, 300,000 meals across these communities. Um, and and then, um, you know, medical, the medical systems, whether it be just delivering masks or um, even creating beds for the heroes, the medical workers that were working um, or um, and then additionally research on you know with the University of Pennsylvania, which I think got um, some um, communication at the university about developing a treatment for uh, you know both healthcare workers, but then ultimately maybe the population. And you know we're blessed with great medical systems, whether it be obviously the University of Pennsylvania or CHOP or. Uh, Barnabas in uh, New Jersey, and so we were able to help all those institutions move, move forward. And then, lastly, you know, I'm I'm basically running. Uh, I have five kids. I'm running, a, in essence, a community college, a college, an elementary school, and a high school here. And everyone has laptops, and so we focus on the fact that there were many kids in the inner city of Philadelphia that didn't have laptops, and so uh, we we bought ten thousand Chromebooks and along with Comcast, who bought some Chromebooks and enabled internet, um, those are uh, distributed or being distributed to kids so they can actually learn similar to the way our kids are learning. And so um, all of that um, has been uh, really exciting to do. And you know, I will say that the other thing that I would mention is that the players have been incredible. So, uh, you know, the players have, in addition to what we can bring to the table, they have millions and millions of followers on social media and so whether it's you know ben simmons stepping up with the philly pledge where he's leading and he's a young man but he's leading and then getting hundreds of thousands of dollars of donations to follow him you know in terms of fill abundance and delivering food or joel Embiid and his analysis of and leadership on uh the treatment of the disease by funding research at penn or al horford you know, helping the communities he's played in and where he's from the Dominican Republic or Travis Zajac doing public service announcements. The players are able to touch thousands and thousands, even millions of people. And they've been they've helped like magnify the, um, you know, what the, the efforts. And so, like, all of us need, you know, we, we I tend to be private about these things and low key. But at the end of the day, like getting other people to do it uh, and, and being a little more public in these efforts has been appropriate. Well, Josh, um, thanks a million. Thanks a million for your time today and for all you're doing. It's truly inspirational, and we're so fortunate to have you as such an engaged member of the Wharton, Penn, and Philadelphia communities. And I'd like to thank the Penn community for um, their leadership, both in terms of you know how they're handling, as a proud parent, how they're handling you know, a very difficult situation, and also. Uh, the Penn medical system and just the leadership they're showing there. And so I'm, I'm proud to be, very proud to be associated with the university and very appreciative of everything you all are doing.